I can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. Free and uncorrupted communication. My background is really as a community activist, and that's what I am. Uh, hey, wow, hi. <laughs> um, and um, I got involved with film and video because it seemed like an extraordinarily useful tool to get information uh, out live in front of people. And independent work allows us to break away from the corporate media and the corporate view of the world. And I think my work may be political, and some folks here and you might think of as less political, but in fact, by the, it seems to me by the mere nature that we're showing a part of the world that we don't get to see on TV, it's all, in a sense, terribly political um, in how we view the world. Um, so most of my work has been around um, U.S. foreign policy issues, and I've focused on the U.S. because I'm a citizen here and I feel some responsibility for what we do both to ourselves and to our brothers and sisters here as well, to, as, well as to people around the world. Um, and uh, what, anything else that we <laughs> If you want to pass the oh, microphone now, we'll, we'll be coming back to you. To, yeah, to yeah, I think that's good. At some point I'd issues. like to... I'd, I'd, at some point, I want to hope to talk a little about our responsibility to the people in our films. Yeah, our that, that, that's on the table. Responsibility sure. to the audience and the issue of objectivity and a few of those. And I, I guess the last thing I'd like to say is um, that I make all the work I do is always with a whole team. And my title as director is more kind of like a circus uh, ring master <laughs> or coordinator and uh, some of the people I work with are here today. Um, Gary Meyer who executive produced uh, Panama Deception, uh, Ken Wallace who's up and shooting and working with for the last two years. So I always work with a team and I really like that because um, I think a whole lot more can get done and we can really explore a lot more and I just don't think I would ever be capable of doing what we've been able to do as a team. And it's really the only way I know how to work, um, for better or for worse. Okay. Uh, that's it. Okay. You're next. <laughs> well. Yeah. Too many directors here. <laughs> um, gosh. Um, well, let's talk about politics. I respect the work you do. I have a different opinion, though. Um, I think politics, there's no room, f in my opinion, for politics in, in filmmaking. I, I think art traditionally should be about man's relationship to nature or to the transcendental, to whatever your view of God is. So I, um, and art historically was really about that up until Dadaism, but I won't give you an art history lesson. I just think um, in order for cinema to be pure, it needs to be free of politics and propaganda because then it becomes propaganda whether you're on the right or the left. And um, as a documentary filmmaker, I think there's a, a real trend toward to politicize the cinema no matter what side of the line you're on right or left and I think that's I don't think I think there needs to be a purity in cinema that needs to be void of politics and and so I aspire to as a filmmaker to make films about cultural things that are try to be apolitical about them I mean because you, you had a point you can say all everything is political but then that's sort of also in my opinion sort of saying everything is relative and I think there, is, there are distinctions, and so I, as a filmmaker, I choose to make things, uh, films about things that are cultural in the documentary world. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, yeah. Okay. We'll be returning to this debate. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, I once thought I wanted to be a writer. It was the only thing I enjoyed doing besides fishing and... Uh, I tried commercial fishing, but it, it was too gross and the work was too hard. <laughs> and uh, I tried writing and I, no one would publish what I wrote. I got rejection slips. 
I got very depressed, and one day I went to a movie in San Francisco called The Seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman, and I came out of the place whistling a happy tune, and I thought, God, <laughs> I finally found someone more depressed than I am. <laughs> I thought, well, well, why not go into movies and do films that do this to people, make them whistle when they come out of a theater? So I started looking for a way to do it, and I finally found my way into film school. And then I found my way into somehow finding people who made me whistle when I made movies on them, when, mm. I, when I got them out into the theaters. And I also like films that you can watch over and over, like a piece of music, and never get tired of it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I started as a kid um, living in like the basement of our Beach Grove, Indiana house, watching old movies and dreaming of, you know, being in movies or making movies, and I ended up um, becoming a singer and moving to New York and working for many years, making a living as a singer and actor, but I realized that that world where you sang in those old movies was, didn't exist anymore. So I segued into a writer and then a producer for television and then a director and working in films where I felt you could really reach people. And my experience working with PBS and A&E, I found that you got what you needed in the sense you always had a crew you had an editor that was yours, you had you know, all the things you needed, but you had someone above you who said, it has to meet these specifications, and this is what our audience wants, and you can't possibly open it this way, because why won't people change the channel? So I thought, I always thought, if I could get my hands in there and finish it myself, and if I had the last word, I know it could be better. And so I decided to start working on my own, kind of the opposite of what Barbara does, and I was probably insane, but I um, made this film, <laughs> so are you, so are we all. But I decided to shoot it myself and light it and do the sound myself and um, edit it and produce it and direct it myself. And I started using a few people in the film and before I was done I had 135, you know, legendary you know, actors who sat down with me. But I found the one thing that happens, since you asked about the style of the way you work, is that people told me things when I was alone in a room with them, knee to knee, that they would never tell me when I had a crew. You know, when I interviewed B. Arthur, she said, um, I thought you were out of your mind. You know, this guy with a home movie camera, I didn't, wouldn't have told you all those things. Mm -hmm. You know, we never thought you'd go anywhere with it. But I built a system with a monitor on the side and a gooseneck arm, and I tore a remote control apart and duct taped it to the handle. And I dispensed with, as we all go through, every time we're interviewed, the person interviewing you on television asks you a question like this, and then they look at their notes the whole time you're talking. And you realize quickly that you'll never look into anyone's eyes. So I mastered a technique of never, ever looking at notes when I interviewed them. Also, if you never take your eye off your subject, they find it very hard to go, I've got like 10 minutes left, you know? So it was kind of an experiment for me, you know, over the last six years making the movie. And I grew to find that my responsibility was not to get ratings, for television, but to preserve something or enlighten or show something to people that might never have happened. You know, so I chose, you know, a hundred actors who dedicated their life to the theater and were therefore never preserved on film. Or at least those halcyon days that they worked weren't. And it became like a detective story for me to to capture them all and find all that footage. And also Barbara inspired me here by reminding you um we're also screening Saturday night. I, I didn't think I should interrupt you, yeah, but oh, Barbara, right. I respect oh, you. Yeah. Good for you. So you have two screenings. We have two screenings, tomorrow at 1.15 and Saturday night at 7.45, and Eva Marie Saint, one of the stars of our film, is doing the screening and the Q&A with me on Saturday night. Oh, wow. Great. Great. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I wanted to be a basketball player, but I was too slow and didn't jump very good. <laughs> so that didn't work out. And I didn't want to work for my dad either, so um, uh, I eventually found my way to film. and. Um, that slowness in basketball is translated into my film work because they seem to take a long time to get anything done. But, um, you know, I guess I, I've always just been really interested in, in stories, interested in people's stories. Uh, I, I'm not a... It, it, we do have quite a variety up here, which is great, I think, um, because I'm not an issue-oriented filmmaker, but, but I, I think that the stories that that I've done, the, the issues, there, there are things about the world that one might define as issues that kind of come out of that in some way. I, I, I'm not sure if it's admirable or not to try and make film that's apolitical. I don't know that it's possible uh, to make anything pure that's a documentary about 
the world we live in. But, um, but I think it could be an interesting fight that you two could get in. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that, um, I don't know, I, uh, I think you should get to the fight. Yeah, yeah, you want to you get to the fight or... <laughs> Maybe we could maybe we could get to the flight kind of obliquely and and I because I thought of it. Why? It's good. <laughs> well, <laughs> the blood factor. Right. <laughs> right. Go for it. Well, no, I, I just thought, uh, and this what I didn't think of this question until you were all talking. But I know something that you have in common is that you do do interviews with your your subjects in the film. So I wonder, and you you talk very. Uh, evocatively about your interview practice, and I know everyone here does that. So when you're interviewing, are you eliciting? Are you, you know, what, what is it you're after when you interview someone? Are you, you interested to reveal their political orientation or your own or get them to say what you want them to say so that you can then edit into something? And so maybe if we talk about that a little and the mechanics, we can prepare the ground for the battle. <laughs> And we don't have to go in any order. And you guys can use this one, too. And actually, I have a law. And they promise to mute me when they need to. Um, actually, wrote notes on that. Um, well, when I interview, yeah, I try to uh, actually to explain to people um, that I won't be in the film, although I am briefly in Waging yes. Peace, um, and that my questions won't be heard, and that we'll weave the story together from what they say, they, they really will become the storytellers. So I make it real clear that they have to speak in a way that it will tell the story. And I sometimes interrupt people unless they're really scared of the camera and then I just let them keep talking and hope mm -hmm. there's stuff in there that's usable. But if they're kind of professionals like the Pentagon spokesman or a congressman, I'll interrupt them and stop them and say, no, 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 I need you to include the subject. Mm -hmm. I need to know what you're talking about. You can't just keep saying they. Um, so I try to get them basically to tell their story and um, I listen and I think while they're speaking if there's follow-up thoughts or questions if they say things that intrigue me um, one of my most uh, ama you know for me a very amazing interview uh, was with uh, General Maxwell Thurman who was in charge Mad Max they called him who was in charge of the invasion of Panama and um, we did this interview and by the time we were done I thought they're not going to let me out of here with the tape this was in Southern Command in Panama um, about six months after the invasion when it was still pretty much in lockdown the country and because he had said things in that interview that I just couldn't believe that he said in that interview, which is why they had never let ABC, CBS, or NBC, CNN, anyone interview him. This man was off, off bounds. But because they had kind of surrounded us and locked us into this refugee camp for hours with extra troops because they wanted to try to get us out, and it, it just turned into this big brouhaha the day before, a few days before, and it hit the uh, news and it, the congressmen were involved and the Pentagon was involved and pretty soon they made it clear to uh, Max that um, they needed to do something in return and we got this interview and uh, it was amazing. He basically said our purpose in going into Panama was to destroy the Panamanian Defense Forces and this was like just a month I mean, it was a month before the invasion, Bush had said, we have no problem with the Panamanian Defense Forces. We have good relationships with them. We just want to get Manuel Noriega. So I couldn't believe he said this thing. So sometimes, and, and, and then sometimes in Panama in particular, it's still kind of one of my more memorable events, that and I guess shooting after 9-11 in New York. Um, people talked a lot about... Uh, uh, they talked about experiences that could only mean to me that there were weapons used, experimental weapons used, that the U.S. military hadn't yet conceded to having used. Um, and those were surprising and shocking uh, revelations that I didn't expect. Um, very few of which we used because we didn't have, we couldn't get anybody on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, you know, like expert side to, to
to back up any of this, and we didn't want to get hung out to dry on it and lose the whole film over a few, th uh, you know, a few issues. So we just have a few short statements in there. But um, yeah, I think I I just try to. Um, we do very long interviews. Um, I, I think um, I learned a little bit from um, um, who we traveled across the country with, the cinematographer. Wex, Wex, Haskell, Haskell Wexler, Wexler, right. And we shoot about the same ratio as him. We shoot about an hour for every minute we use. Mm -hmm. So we really let people tell us their story and then we find the peach in there that adds to the, the thread of the whole story, something mm -hmm. we, we didn't have and we needed. Um, and that's kind of how we interview, I interview. Mm -hmm. And with, also with a very small crew, usually just me and uh, a camera person. So, and, and eventually they forget about the camera person because I always keep them a little bit behind. Me. So now what about this, this idea of trying to reveal something, to reveal, get the, the interview subject to, to come across with some material that's going to be compelling. Does anyone want to respond to, yeah? Well, one thing I found, and this is an awkward thing to say at an evening like this, but I did find that some people came up to me and they would say to me, meaning it as a compliment, they'd say, this isn't like a documentary at all. It's like a movie. And I'd say, why do you say that? They'd say, because it's entertaining and it's, and I cried and, you know, so I found that I would try and incite people so they didn't feel, you know, like they were being lectured. And one way I found that I really stumbled on but I loved was I would try and get people to argue with each other long distance over many years, which doesn't make much sense, but I would tell someone, well, you know, um, Stephen Sondheim said this. And they'd say, that's ridiculous. And then I'd cut to Steven saying it, and then someone, yeah. and it's one of the most successful things, I think, in the film is Tommy Toon and B. Arthur fight, you know, and Cheetah Rivera and Sondheim, you know, go back and forth. And I think the greatest compliment, because you work so hard, is when someone gets it. I think Peter Travers saw the film recently and did a Q&A with me afterwards. And he said, I intellectually know that you shot over 100 people over five years all over the world. But you cannot tell me, and I've seen your film twice, that all these people are not sitting in one room talking directly to me over two hours' time. And I almost cried on stage. I thought, oh, God, you know, we fooled them again. But, you know, it's that I think you develop a technique, you know, and if you interview enough people, you find you want to build a complete bond of trust with them where they'll tell you things no one else would. You do all the homework you can so Which you know you more about them than they do. You, you no, I don't think you no. breach it. I think you take them somewhere that they might not have gone before. And I don't think anyone in my films ever come off as anything but brilliant, you know. Mm -hmm. They come off intelligent. I would never compromise someone to, you know, when I did the documentary for Mike Nichols about drag queens, these people wanted to be in a movie, you know. They would tell me anything. And I thought, mm -hmm. that's the first time I learned that you have a profound responsibility because we live in an era, and God, that was 10 years ago, not to mention today, when people would kill each other to get on a fourth-rate reality show on a cable access channel, you know? <laughs> so you know that when you sit across from people and you just cannot, you know, if they're famous and they have a reputation, you know, it, there's an honor system, you know? I mean, if they're bad people, you know, when they tell you something, you know, yeah. and they clearly believe it, you know, but I don't think you trick, I don't, I don't think I trick people, I think mm -hmm. I, you do romance them in some way, but it is, it's a romance. Mm -hmm. You know, sitting because alone in a room Because people expose themselves. They expose and things to we, you that they might not have told right. their, people have told me, I've never told my husband or wife yeah. that. Kim Hunter told me about working with Ilya Kazan and Brando. She said, I never told my husband this story. I said, don't stop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's true, they do, I don't know what it is. First of all, 90% of the people that interview you, as I'm sure you've all found, never do their homework. This is, that's why you're such a great yeah. exception. <laughs> So when you interview someone and you really know what you're talking about, they figure out in about 10 minutes, when I interviewed Jerry Orbach, he closed his eyes while I asked questions and rested. And then, uh, then he'd say, when I first came to New York. But about 10 minutes into the interview, he looked at me twice and he, he must have thought, oh my God, this is a real person who knows what he's talking about. Then it just opened the floodgates. Mm -hmm. And he just told story after story and you could see that I had taken him back in time just because I was the conduit that knew something that he'd forgotten he knew. You know, Marlon Brando told me, he said, I haven't thought of these things in 50 years. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what we hope happens, I think. Yeah. So now
Now, now, what's the experience interviewing people who are regular people, who aren't, you know, military men or state statesmen or famous drag celebrity drag queens? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, so you can chime right in. But. Uh, well, my, my, in my experience, um, you know, a lot of the, the strongest moments in the films that I've done are verite moments. You know, they're, they're you know, where you're just capturing people uh, as you know, candidly as you can in a moment, doing something, not, not interacting with me as a filmmaker or being interviewed by me as a filmmaker. Um, those, are the, those are the moments that are the strongest, I think, in the work that I've done. But I've found that, um, and I'm in a, maybe in a little different position. I don't know. I, don't, I haven't seen your film yet. I've heard great things about it, but I don't know how long you, of time you spent with your subject, how long a period of time you, you dealt with them. So this may not be true what I'm about to say, which is I think uh, I'm a little bit more of the exception in terms of the amount of time that I film with any given subject. And so there is this evolution of relationship that, that happens over years. And during the course of that, those years, I will interview people, the main subjects on a regular basis, not, not once a month or anything, but we will sit down at periodic intervals and, and do interviews. And it's almost like taking stock of things, taking stock of what's happened over the last so many months or year. It becomes this almost therapeutic relationship, I find, in films uh, between a filmmaker and a, and a subject. Because most people don't, uh, I, I think people who are famous are used to being interviewed all the time. And you're trying to break through a different kind of thing, which is I've been interviewed 10 million times. And this is just 10 million and one. And you're trying to make it different. In the case of the people I'm dealing with, they've never been interviewed by, by people. No one's ever asked them what they thought of anything, usually. Um, and I think that that becomes an interesting experience for them being in the film because it becomes this sort of almost therapeutic kind of relationship where they feel like actually for the first time in many respects that somebody actually does care what they think about mm -hmm. things. And not just about themselves, but about, but we talk about anything, you know, we talk about I mean, I'm a firm believer that, you know, welfare mothers have a lot more to tell us about welfare than, than academics and, and people like that. So, um, so that, that's one thing I think that makes it a little different. Um, I think the other thing is that the best interviews that I've gotten, by and large, there, there's sort of two things I've discovered over the years. The people that are really great on the phone if you haven't met them yet and you're trying to arrange a shooting, the people who sound really great on the phone, you get off the phone, you go, they're going to be a great interview. Generally are not very good, in my experience. It's the people that go, oh, uh, no, you don't really want to talk to me. I, you know, the, the, the people that don't think they have anything or are any good at it that always blow me away and are, are incredible once you actually break through that with them. They're incredible interviews. The other thing is, is that I've found that the best interviews that I've gotten generally over the years have been in the middle of something that is going on that is very potent for them. We might be filming uh, something that's unfolding that's quite dramatic in their lives and, and just like in real life there might be a lull where nothing is really going on and you're just sort of standing there and I oftentimes will use that moment to say, well, what's going on? What do you think? What's happening with you? And those are the most unguarded moments mm -hmm. where people are so the most in touch with what's going on with them. And I find the most eloquent things get said at, at those times versus the sit down, okay, now we're going to have an interview, you know, set the camera up here, you sit here, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a microphone? I think you're next, George. Of the, do you end up getting caught up in the live, say, Rodney Bingenheimer? Yeah, I shot, I shot Rodney Bingenheimer for about five years, off and on. And um, um, my mother was a psychologist, was a political activist and then a psychologist, so she knew how to Aha. engage people really well. <laughs> this yeah. is getting kind of revealing. <laughs> I'm not your mother. I was, <laughs> I was at all the anti-war rallies as a youth. but um, <laughs> He's a rebel. <laughs> a rebel against a rebel. Right. But um, uh, I, I learned from her how to engage people, and you just... Um, you know, sometimes I go into these, uh, when I do feature films too, and sometimes I go into these meetings, uh, meetings with these, you know, very narcissistic studio executives, 
and you know, basically I'll ask them one question about themselves and they'll, and they'll spend 20 minutes just talking about themselves and I'll say one or two words and uh -huh. I'll, I'll leave the meeting and my agent will call me later that afternoon and the executive will have told my agent, that guy was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so people love to talk about themselves and you just sit there and it's, um, you know, you're just, uh, it's kind of cognitive therapy, Carl Rogers, you know, it's, you just kind of, they're listening and, and letting them uh, talk, and it was specifically with Mayor of the Sunset Strip, what was interesting for me was I was dealing with these celebrities like um, pop stars like Gwen Stefani to David Bowie, Mick Jagger, well, a ton of them, and I was interested, I, I think they were expecting me, if you don't know about the film, it's this radio DJ in LA who launched a lot of careers and he's obsessed with celebrity and He's kind of a met I saw him as kind of a metaphor for what's happened to our culture. And I think a lot of these celebrities were anticipating me asking them, you know, what did Rodney, Rodney mean to the music world? What did he mean to you? But what I was really interested in, frankly, was I, I was interested in finding a common thread between Rodney, the sort of stargazer, star creator, and the celebrities themselves. And the thing about Rodney is if you see the movie, Rodney is a kid who was abandoned by his mother at 15, literally dropped off in Hollywood. At and, House of. of Connie Stevens. He, he was a Connie Stevens fan and uh, grew up in Mountain View and his mother said, well, if you love Connie Stevens so much, let her take care of you. And literally dropped him off at Connie Stevens' doorstep at 15. She wasn't at home. He went down to the Sunset Strip and engaged an aspiring songwriter named Sonny Bono. And the story goes on from there. But Rodney was always looking for something um, that he never got at home. His father left him when he was f three years old and his mother abandoned him when he was 15. And he, he suffers from acute abandonment anxiety, which I think a lot of our culture suffers from. You know, fragmented families, divorce is huge. And so Rodney was looking for something that he never got at home in celebrity. And so I, you know, and we sort of pedestalize these stars, but the one sort of common denominator I found in all of them was that they all came to Hollywood, not all of them, speaking broadly, but many of them came to Hollywood for the some, same reason they were coming to look for something they never got at home. Because in order to endure sort of the slings and arrows of Hollywood, you, you have to be used to some kind of abuse at, at, on the home front, <laughs> seriously, to tolerate it. And so I found this common thread, and as I started asking these personal questions, like Courtney Love completely freaked out, and she started going to the whole thing about her dad, left her in a Grateful Dead concert, and he was, he was tripping on acid, and, 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 and just really personal stuff, and, the, and there, there was this common thread that, that Rodney shared with all these people that I shared with them too. You know, I come from divorced parents, and and so in that sense, um, and, and these celebrities also found that a, a big threat because their their commodity, their way of making a living, is that that pedestalized image, and to sort of deconstruct that becomes sort of a threat. So I had a lot of them really uncomfortable with the interviews afterwards, which I thought was really interesting because mm -hmm. it, it sort of threatened their image in a way by humanizing them, mm -hmm. and. Um, and, uh, and so that, and, but in, in the long run, I saw Rodney sort of a metaphor for what's happened to our own country. You know, we're so obsessed with celebrity now, particularly in the last 20 years, 30 years, where, the, where our culture is so fragmented um, and so decadent that, you know, we're filling those, thing, those things we used to have, like, uh, for a lot of people, like um, church or, or family, we no longer have. So we, we fill those, yes. that vacuum with celebrity. And, and so Rodney's sort of a metaphor for that. I loved your film, by the way. I love that moment with Cher and, uh, and the mother thing. He's, he's, he's great. He puts in some very surprising things. Yeah, if someone else would have cut it out, could I tell them? Sure. If, well, I'll tell it all wrong, but he's asking um, Cher about her memories of Rodney's mother. And Cher's trying to do the perfect interview, and she goes, um, Rodney, did I meet your mother? And then you see Rodney's behind, and he goes, you met my mother, don't you remember? You really liked her? And she goes, what did I say about her? You know, and it's clear that she says, "Just tell me what to say. I will say it. He'll get what he needs." And you think uh, it breaks your heart because you think this guy, his whole yeah. life is based on the acceptance of these people, and and he doesn't comment. But you think, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. very nice. Yeah. Now, Les said, it always seems that you are uh, are one with your the people in your films. How do you? Uh, make your way into these communities and what's your sense of your participation with these people in films? Oh, well, if you've been around me for very long, you'll realize I don't really say a lot. And, <laughs> Perfect guest. <laughs> uh, Werner Herzog was 
showing his films at the American Cinematheque in L.A. I wasn't there, but I had a friend videotape what he said, and I was amused to see that when he referred to me, he said, Les Blank is not monosyllabic. Les Blank is zero syllabic. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's kind of a hindrance if you want to be a documentary filmmaker and get people to talk. On the other hand, because I don't talk, people start feeling sorry for me, or they, 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 they want to fill the void. And they start talking for some miraculous reason. And I'm happy to accommodate them and record what they have to say. But also, sometimes if you listen when they're talking, you'll hear a word or a phrase, or you'll be struck by a direction the conversation could be going in. So you might just suggest something or ask a question that lets them elaborate on one angle they're talking about, and it sort of veers into that. So that's a way of sort of like being a shepherd and uh, mm -hmm. helping the sheep down the trail, just like showing them another way they can get over the river rather than coming in out of the cold with a question totally unrelated to anything else and saying, you know, why did you do so and so? And people sort of stop and it throws them off the track. So I guess it's just trying to keep the subject on the track, but leading them down the track you want them to go down. And uh, one of the more interesting interviews, which I should probably talk about because it's being shown here, Sunday at 2, Burden of Dreams, when I was doing the film, I kept wondering how I was going to get Werner to say something for the camera. He's always on the verge of death and insanity, and you couldn't just stop him and point the camera at him and say, Werner, tell me what you're thinking, or why are you doing this now? And so I was uh, almost, I was like one week from finishing the shooting. I never had a good interview with Werner. And I brought down a friend of mine named Michael Goodwin, who was a writer and a pretty good interviewer, I guess. And he had filled in for Pacho Lane, who had been my assistant, who had to go back to the States. And we were coming back from a shoot one night after uh, filming a real hard day of shooting when they were chopping down trees or falling in the river and the Indians were all in these canoes and the uh, directing was real hard. and. When it was all over, we had about a two-hour boat trip back from that location to the camp. And the, the sky was lit up with all these stars, and the night-blooming flowers were filling the air with this real sweet odor. And my friend was sitting next to Werner, and he looked up and said, the stars are beautiful, aren't they, Werner? And Werner looked up and said, no, these stars are a mess. And he started railing against nature and against God and everything else in the universe. And, and then my friend told me later what he had said, and I said, that's very real curious. Let's uh, bring that up next, as soon as we can catch him at a, in a free moment, which we did. Mm -hmm. And we got the what we call the mad speech. It's the speech at the end where Werner starts talking about these very things. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was serious, like King Lear. But when I showed it to a trial audience, people started laughing. And I, <laughs> and I thought, this is very interesting. And then I edited the film knowing I would get a laugh at that point. So it all builds up to that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. this, um, is, go ahead. this is making me think about uh, Hearts of Darkness now as he's describing trying to elicit this interview from someone who's uh, involved in these cataclysmic events or events that he perceives as being cataclysmic. Did you... Want to say anything about your experience? Well, first let me say that um, Les Blank is one of the reasons I became a filmmaker. I saw Burden of Dreams when I was in high school, and uh, yeah. and uh, uh, Fax Bar, my co-director and I used um, uh, Burden of Dreams as uh, our blueprint. You know, basically, I mean, we had all this footage that Ellie had shot in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, Hearts of Darkness kind of was a story that told itself. I mean, Francis was a, is, a, is a very operatic, and uh, there wasn't, we had so much, we could have made a miniseries out of it. I mean, there's so much great stuff. So, um, yeah. Uh, did you have a specific question, though? Because I, I was just kind of rambling. There. No, no, go okay. ahead. You're no, no, to, that's you're fine. That's all ramble. I have to say you're about that. You're supposed to ramble. And so now what happens, though, when you're interviewing these people, and Les was talking about this, trying to be a shepherd, and whenever you interview someone, they are, you're, you're making words come into existence that wouldn't exist if you weren't there asking these questions. 
But then what happens when it ratchets up a level when actually you're, you're beginning to, to subtly shape or not so subtly shape the course of people's lives? And I think that's particularly what happens with your uh, long associations with these subjects over time, like with Stevie, and you have, there's been a lot of controversy swirling around your uh, beginning to, to be a person in his life apart from this person who's filming his life. And in fact, that was your relationship from the start. Um, so what is your responsibility as a filmmaker? And I see, I wonder about that with Rodney uh, Bingenheimer as well, and, and anyone else who would care to chime in. You know, what, what happens when you're then, what, you've caused so, something to come into being. So what's the responsibility to your subjects yeah. having made a if film about them? You're, if that? you're counseling your subject on plea bargaining oh, okay. in a child molestation case, well, as occurs in the right. film Stevie. Of course, he never listened to me about anything. So, <laughs> But, um, I, you know, I mean, I think there's a big difference for those of you who have seen the film Stevie and, and have seen the film Hoop Dreams. There, there are two very different films in a lot of ways. I mean, the similarities are that spent years, you know, sort of tracking the story, and they're both, both films have verite moments, and, and, you know, they're stories, in a sense, that unfold. But they're very different in the sense that, um, you know, in Hoop Dreams, uh, I met uh, the subjects of Hoop Dreams in the course of wanting to do a film about kids who, you know, have this dream of, you know, using basketball to escape the inner city. And so it was in the course of wanting to do a film on them that I met the subjects. And so the relationship with them, which grew and, and became personal, not just filmmaker subject, but any good film, I think that happens, you know, between filmmaker and subject. But it, it grew as a result of this shared endeavor of making a film. And I always think of, uh, I always think of these films as shared endeavors in a way. I know that I get to make the final decisions of editorially and all that and I'm aware of that and I don't, I don't mislead people into thinking that they're going to make those final calls. But I also, but, but I also make a point of including them in the sense of being able to see it before it's done and comment on it and talk about it and, and if there are pro things they have issues with in the film or problems with then I, I will if I feel like it doesn't compromise, the, you know, what I think is the truth of the film, I, I try and deal with that in some way. So there, I don't feel like the subjects are completely powerless. I think the, the different thing about Stevie was is that I knew him long before he was ever a film subject because I was this advocate big brother. And um, in the course of trying to do a much more modest film, he got into a lot of trouble and the film became about that. And I realized once he got into really serious trouble, that if I was going to continue to make the film, which was a, you know, which is a uh, important question in this film because it, it is a film that some people, some of you who may have seen it or will see it, might come away and say, well, you shouldn't have made the film. That's what I think. And but if I was going to make the film, I felt like it, the only honest way to proceed was to be fully candid about my involvement in his life and in, and in this ongoing situation where he was arrested and being charged with molestation. So I, uh, I felt like if it was going to be an honest film at all, I could not, that could not be off camera in the sense that the way in which a, a relationship with a subject might normally unfold. Um, you know, what Barbara was saying, a lot of times when you do interviews and you say, answer in complete sentences because I don't want my questions in. Well, that was my modus operandi with film like Hoop Dreams. There's only a couple of places in the film where you hear me interact with the subjects in that whole three-hour movie, but there were moments where I felt that you really got something from that, whereas in Stevie, I didn't worry about that at all because I felt like my relationship to him was part of what this film was about, and so I did not, I, I expected that interviews between me and him were more like scenes between me and him, not formal interviews. I don't know if that answers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then in, I just wanted to pick up on something with uh, the mayor of Sunset Strip when uh, there's that scene in the film where Rodney is seated next to this woman who, right. Camille, who's been very important in his life. Right. And you press right. a bit. Yeah, no, I, that's where I, I sometimes question whether I wasn't crossing a line. There's, in the film, if you get a chance to see the film, which I think is playing tomorrow night, um, 
he, there's a girl in his life he's very much in love with, and um, over the course of the five years as I was shooting him, it was very clear to me that his view of this girl and their relationship was very different from hers, and um, he thought that they were going to get married, and he was very much in love with her, and it was very, you know, it was strange because, you know, he could only call her two days out of the week, and if they were going to get married, I thought it was a very odd relationship, but it wasn't for me to judge, it wasn't for me to judge, no. But, and she was always with him when he was around the pop stars, but when she wasn't around the pop stars, she didn't want anything to do with him. And, and, and yet he really thought he was going to get married. And it was very sad. And, and of course his friends and would say, come on, she's using you, Rodney. And he was like, no, no. And Rodney's very, very, gives people the benefit of the doubt. Like, he defines that f phrase. I mean, and, um, and so I, it, one situation in the film where I put them on a bed together and she really wanted to talk about her career and... And I started questioning about their relationship and the validity of the relationship. And that was a situation that I controlled. And though she did allow herself to be, these questions to be asked of her, but I basically put her on the spot and their whole relationship broke down at that moment on camera. So, and I... You did it. I, I, yeah, I, I'm responsible f for creating that situation. So it was definitely, I was, there was a line there, but ultimately I was, I guess, forcing her and both of them to articulate um, the relationship as it was. I mean, because it was a very odd relationship. So, um, yeah, so one could argue whether or not I violated, uh, you know, some moral, some film ethics there. And I may have, but it was a decision I made at the time, and um, I did it. So it's on film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's, yeah. Maybe it's not good. Maybe it's not good. Maybe it's not good. It was it, ultimately. Um, I think Rodney was happy that he finally dealt with the reality of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to go slightly oblique, and then we will open it up. I promise. Um, in our democratic society, there's this rather strong appetite for journalistic objectivity. And there's this idea that documentaries are and should be balanced and truthful, and hence the title of our panel, The Truth of Nonfiction. Um, but yet some of the most powerful documentaries that I've seen um, make it a point not to be objective and make it a point to come out with a certain perspective that they define and foreground and acknowledge as such. So where do you stand, all of you, on this imperative that documentaries, you know, need be, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, 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 yeah right. that's for you, right, yeah. Um, well, as to the issue of objectivity, I'll believe in objectivity the day I see a plethora of films coming out about the pain and tragedy it must be to be born or to be um, uh, raised in such a way that makes you a pedophile, a brutal pedophile. When I see that, I'll believe there is such a concept as objectivity. We, we hear all about, I'm, I'm not in favor of pedophiles, or pedophilia, I should say. <laughs> You know, we always hear the victim's point of view, understandably, in such a uh, tragic situation. But if there were true objectivity, for instance, mm -hmm. it seems to me, mm -hmm. we would understand what it would be like for some of these people in prison who say, please kill me because I'm just going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And so we don't, so anyway, for starters, that would be my base argument for saying there is no, I've yet to see it. And so you're saying not all the points of view are represented? I've yet to see it. Uh -huh. And I certainly don't uh, suggest that I'm objective. I, I think we're all subjective. Everything is subjective. I come from a belief that um, killing people is a bad thing. Uh, starving children is a bad thing. Um, rape is a bad thing. Uh, I mean, I have a set of beliefs that, um, that have everything to do with how I portray what I see. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I think that any time we read a piece of journalism or watch a piece of TV or watch a movie, we should say, who made that? And, and you know, what's, who's paying them? Where did they get the funds to make that point of view to come to your TV or to your movie theater? Because that's their objective, subjective point of view to some degree. Now, I, I'm not trying to uh, malign people who are better funded because I, I think they're... <laughs> because that's not the point at all. Um, so we don't... Uh, you know, I, I try to be honest, I try to get to the truth mm -hmm. as I understand it. When we do an hour and a half film like the Panama Deception or cover up behind the Iran-Contra affair, for instance, which are real exposés, we don't spend a lot of that one and a half hours of precious time that we're going to actually get on the television set and actually get into theaters. We don't waste a lot of that time informing the audience of what they hear every single night on the news and read every single day in the paper. It just seems like a waste of that precious time that we're able to sweat for and buy, basically, to get that film out and get it distributed. So, yeah, we try to present... We try to present information so that people can... so that people can be objective, subjective, so they have information they didn't have before on which they can make their subjective decision and frame and have their opinions on uh, what's going on in the world and, uh, and what we should or shouldn't be doing about it. But I, I, have, I just don't comprehend the concept of a human being doing something objective. I mean, I don't get it. I mean, that would be like, I just don't get it. Yeah. I, I agree with Barbara. I think it's impossible. I think it's, and as George said, he tries to remain pure. And this is nothing personal, but once you attempt to be pure, you're not pure. I'm sorry. You know, pure is, is untouched by. And once you can intellectually make a choice that I will try to remain pure, there's no pureness about that at all. I think you just try and remain honorable in the end. You know, I mean, how can Al Mazel's you know, and his brother make those films, salesman, and and um, the one about the Bouvier, Grey Gardens. yeah, Grey Gardens, and somehow not cross that boundary. I mean, they really go into those people's lives, but they don't, they they don't take advantage of them. And I didn't think your film took advantage of Rodney Bingenheimer either. I think you were very fair, and I think it, it was clear to me intellectually that you were you were balancing. And that's, I think, the bottom line. I don't think any of us can be pure. We can't truly be objective, because if, you if you're objective, you're not a filmmaker. I mean, I don't really care to see anything by someone who doesn't have an opinion, or, or is trying to, you know, or pick the middle ground or something. I mean, it is a personal, you know, medium. So, you know, I think it's, a, it's an awkward thing, and hopefully successfully balanced by I mean, when I, when, I fr when I first made that statement to counter yours about Objectivity, it's impossible to be objective, of course. Everything is subjective. But I, there's a difference between subjectivity and politicizing. Um, my, my reaction is that, I mean, just to be candid, I, you know, documentary filmmaking is completely dominated by the political left. Completely funding, subject matter. No, I mean, that's fine. Whether you're left or right, whatever, whatever your politics are. But the, the kinds of documentary filmmaking that get funded by the NEA or, or get funding from... And how come I can't get funded? I'm, I won an Academy Award. Well, I, I wasn't talking, I wasn't specifically referring to your, your film, but... But a lot of films like ours. Where's the other But one? I think, I think, I think... Uh, uh, I think honestly and unfairly there's a, there's a, there, there's, there's not a polemic in documentary film, a political polemic, there's not, you're not looking at both sides fairly because most issues um, are issues that favor the left um, and their arguments, uh, no, whether they're uh, arguments about American foreign policy to social issues. Look who, look who funds, Pete, look who funds, where, where do we get most of our, where do we see, where does the public see most of its documentaries? It's what, PBS, where else? History Channel. 
Well, but uh, even C even CBS, okay. NBC, and ABC. But look at let's look at PBS, which is supposedly right. supposedly supposed to be objective because they're using our tax dollars, and they're supposedly supposed to show both sides of issues. And you know, during the Iraq War, it's uh, like nothing. You wait another six months after it's all said and done, there'll be finally the expose that doesn't really matter. I mean, it, it'll matter, and we're right. hoping to work on one. I mean, get one done, but it. It's after the fact, after the soldiers have been died. I, look who funds PBS. Look at the look at the look at the labels at the end of the every, every show. It's Exxon. It's who does the business hour. It's all the big, it's all the big brokerage firms. It, it, there's no show called Labor Beat other than in Chicago, <laughs> where you have a, where there's a an hour or a half hour weekly about what's happening in the labor movement, how we are winning some of our battles, what are the strategies we're using. We don't get that. I mean, look who funds these things, and I'm telling you, it is not the left. I cannot get funding. That, that's true. The money might not come for the left, but the people who make the decisions about where the money is allocated definitely are people whose politics fall on the left, without then why question. Then doesn't, why don't films and that, that, that That's been... true at the networks, too, CBS, NBC, ABC. Absolutely. That's absolutely, okay. without without Barbara. question. It may have been. <laughs> there, there was a time, you know, maybe 20 years ago, when the 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 more mainstream media, you know, like NBC, when they were actually really doing documentaries, when they did things like the Pentagon Papers right. and things like that, where you, I think, well, you, the politics are driven by money primarily. Well, well, but. Well, there, there's no but after that. I mean, that's <laughs> no. I mean, <laughs> no. But I mean, the thing, the thing, the thing is, the thing is, is that is that I think there was a time when America was actually more liberal in its in its mainstream media. Period. We are not in that time now, and I think that the networks. What what is the network's definition of real documentary? I mean, of Public, we should call it public affairs programming because it's not documentary. It's Dateline. It's these little crime things they have. You know, it's it's 2020. It's celebrity journalism. It's, I mean, we're we're not living in a time when the, when people's main sources of media. Uh, I mean, the New York Times is not as liberal as it once was. The Washington Post is not as liberal as it once was. I mean, these are mainstream opinion-leading publications that have changed. So, But I disagree with you because if you look at the stories I cover, for example, um, give you an example, the Rosenberg story, uh, when uh, the, was the um, Vivendi cables were released and it was proven that the Rosenbergs were in fact, were, for Julian Rosenberg was in Ju fact a Soviet yeah. spy. Julius, not Julius, Ethel. Julius, not Ethel, Julius. but Julius yeah. was in fact a Soviet yeah. spy. I mean, the New York Times buried that on page 30. But, uh, but, of, but, of, like, look a metro section. but look what's get... Weapons of mass destruction before we even started the war. But we don't look, know that. Look yet. what's. We don't know that yet. Look what's. Look. Wait, I gotta say, I gotta say, I have to just say what. Well, we're gonna be well I was just gonna make one point. Minutes, yeah, I, I was on. just gonna make one. I mean, because these are the kind of things you can't resolve, right. you know. Yeah. Like, but look at the fact that in, you know, with embedded journalists and during the war, for example, that. We didn't. We have not seen. We still haven't seen. When Vietnam, Vietnam was on the televisions of America, mm -hmm. there, and and that was when there was no way of even instantaneously showing you what happened. That was shot on film. They had to send it back. They had to develop it. They had to put it on the air. We have not seen what went on in Iraq. We we have not seen a dead. Iraqi, a dead American, barely. We haven't seen any of this. It's, it's not illegal now. They passed it in the last funding bill that it is now illegal in this country to video or film a casket being brought off a plane with an American flag on it of a soldier returning home. It is now illegal. We are not allowed to shoot the soldiers being returned because they don't want it in the media. Media, the stories we hear in the media further the economic interests of the corporations who own the media. It's that simple. <laughs>